got people here now, this time, that are going to stay for a while, I guess. All right. Or do we? Everything's good now? We're all set? Everybody here? Okay. Well, as characteristic of my dear brother Bissell, he called me late last night and told me that we were going to do this. <laughs> so I really wasn't prepared. I don't like to keep saying that, but that's, I'm just telling you the truth. That's how it happened. But I did have, I had preached on Sunday, the meeting that I knew I was going to preach, and had prepared the message uh, on the birth marks of a true believer, and I had remnants of notes all over the place that I did not incorporate into that message as I tried to rework that message, as some of you heard. If you were here, I preached uh, last Sunday, was it? Was it last Sunday? Uh, I preached a, a message called the birthmark, or seven birthmarks of a true believer, which I explained to you was a one service message when it originally was prepared, and I still have those notes, just like they were, that I wrote. And then that message became a series of messages. So every birthmark was a full message. And so there were seven of them, so there were seven meetings that were that I would give those birthmarks, seven, seven birthmarks of a true believer. So being, I had a million, million and one other things to do, but the Lord was burdening me to preach that message, and I know I couldn't do that in one day or one service, and but that was the, bur I believe God wanted me to preach that message, so I, I worked it and, and uh, it didn't work. I didn't get it for one meeting, but we did it in two services, morning and evening. But uh, when Pastor called me last night, I, I just had all the other notes, and I, to this afternoon I just sat and pulled those notes that I did things I didn't say, and that's probably what I'm that is what I'm going to share with you tonight, <laughs> believing that's what the Lord had me to do. It's the most recent thing I prepared, so bear with me. Okay, so uh, let's uh, we'll turn to the let's look at the text that we looked at Sunday, Philippians three seventeen, just as a springboard text. I'm not expounding a passage, which oftentimes I do, and I believe in the exposition of the Word of God. I think that's one of the best ways to teach. But um, there are places where you can preach a uh, textual sermon from a text without expounding great lengths of Scripture, and there is a place for topical sermons occasionally. Some people make a uh, living at a topical sermons, and I think you need exposition too. There's nothing wrong with uh, talking about topics. Sometimes we have to get topical. You go to the doctor, and you have a problem, and uh, you tell him you got a pain in your knee, and he starts working on your head. He said, well, we're just going to work on this whole thing till we get down to the problem. Some people are expounding scripture. That's their excuse. Said, well, we'll get, to the, we'll get to every issue as we expound the Word of God. That's good. I mean, I understand that, and I believe in exposition. Sometimes we've got to get topical. If you've got a pain in your knee, the doc's got to work on your knee, amen? You can't start on your head. He doesn't, he doesn't say, well, here's a prescription. It says go in the drugstore and start at the front counter and just take all the medicine until you find the right one, amen? I mean, to get specific, he writes a prescription for the problem you have. And so sometimes there's a topic that I think needs to be uh, spoken to, and Charles Spurgeon did that. Many uh, great preachers of days gone by preach topical messages, textual messages, textual topical messages, and uh, some get on hobby horses and they rant and rave against that and say it's you know, not biblical just to preach te topical messages, but it is. It's perfectly all right. Jesus talked about topics, and he gave many topical messages as he uh, uh, spoke in the New Testament, and so to say that's wrong would be foolish, but some do. They just get on these things and do that. But anyway... I'm using this as a springboard text, that's the point, and it's not, we're not going to expound Philippians chapter 3 necessarily, but I want to read uh, Philippians 3, 17 through the end of the chapter like we did Sunday in the morning and the evening, just to remind you again of what it says, and then we'll pray when I'm done reading it, and we'll begin what I have for you tonight. Paul says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an, an, an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, 
whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And again, Father, we <coughs> thank you for your word. And we ask tonight, Lord, that you would subdue our proud, stubborn wills tonight. Help us, Lord, to depend wholly upon you. May our dependence be uh, on you fully tonight, for without you we can do absolutely nothing. As your word says, we would acknowledge that. And so, Lord, uh, this would be for naught and a waste of time, lest you meet with us. Your spirit would speak to the hearts of those you brought to this uh, basement tonight. Uh, for this uh, time, I pray that, uh, that this time would be profitable spiritually, and Lord, that we glorify and honor you. And I pray that my friends and brothers and sisters and, and I would learn together your word, that it would draw us near unto you, that we might uh, learn things that would help us uh, in our days to come. And uh, Lord, if there be any in our midst that lack the birthmarks of a genuine believer uh, tonight here in, in this uh, meeting, I pray that your spirit would convict them of their desperate need to, to trust Christ and believe on Him who is life eternal. We ask that you would deal with us individually as according to our individual needs and Lord uh, especially I ask that you'd speak through me to the hearts of those represented here. Enable me Lord to communicate to them the things that you desire for us to learn tonight we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Alright well I gave you the birthmarks of a true believer and I shared at the beginning of that message that if could be the most important message that some would ever hear if they would have been in that meeting that day because I'm giving you what the Bible says are marks of true Christianity. So many people in this day and age walk an aisle and say a prayer like I did when I was a kid. They make some kind of profession. They give some kind of mental assent to the Word of God. And yet they don't have the marks that the Bible says will be in a, tr a person's life when they're really born again. I emphasize that you can't put these marks in yourself. I am not trying to preach these things to encourage people to just try to conjure this things up, these things up and put them in their own life. You can't do that. If you don't have them, you need to cast yourself at the mercy of God and trust Him, come to the end of yourself and serving sin and serving the devil, and uh, receive Christ as your Savior. You might be saved, and God, when you get genuinely born again, gives you these marks. He puts these marks in you. It's like a... Uh, a physical birthmark. You, if you have a birthmark, you didn't put it there. It was there when you were born. Uh, you didn't put it in yourself. Any mark we have in our that we did ourselves is a scar. Uh, anything you do to yourself to scar your body or something, or something you did is simply a scar and, and uh, not uh, a birthmark. So we talked about the birthmarks of a true believer. I gave you seven marks. On Sunday morning, I gave you three. The first one was biblical repentance. We gave you scripture for eat for that mark, Luke 13, 3. Jesus said, I tell ye nay, but except you repent, you shall all, all likewise perish. We gave you Acts 17, 30, where God commands all men everywhere to what? Repent. And then we looked at 2 Peter 3, 9, where it says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We talked about repentance. I told you what it was not. I gave you many, many passages of the scripture to explain to you that repentance is a biblical doctrine, and I told you what it was biblically. I'm not going to do that again. I gave you the second birthmark, a new heart. We need a new heart because the heart is, de de uh, is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. That's a pretty awesome statement. It says, who can know it? We don't even know our own hearts. We don't know them. And so we need a new heart. And... Uh, we learned in Ezekiel 36, 26 that God said to Ezekiel, a new heart will I give you. He gives that new heart. And a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36, 26. And so the second birthmark was a new heart. The third was a family bond or a love for the brethren. The Bible says, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. The world hates you when you get saved. We know we have passed from death unto life. Why? Say it with me. You should remember it. Because we love the brethren. Amen? We know that because we love the brethren. And yet so many people, they claim they have been saved, have a disdain in their heart for the brethren. I'm going to talk about that more tonight. But the third birthmark is a 
common bond, a family bond, a love for the brethren, for God's people, which led us to the fourth birthmark, an understanding and an insatiable hunger for the Word of God. Before I was saved, I tried to read this book. I said I believed in God. I said I believed in the same thing that my mother believed in, and the people down in the little church where I heard John 3.16 as a kid, but when I tried to read the Bible, I never could understand it. I had no time to read the Bible, no interest to read the Bible. When I tried to read the Bible, it made absolutely no sense to me, and uh, I had no time or place for it before I was saved. When I got saved, I, I uh, couldn't live without it, and you couldn't either if you got saved. And so understanding, you understand it, and you have an insatiable hunger for it. It's a supernatural thing we talked about on uh, Sunday evening is when we gave you that mark. First uh, Corinthians 2.14 said, The natural man receives not things of the Spirit of God, they're foolishness to him. And so unsaved men will not hunger for the Word, nor understand it. The words there mean, when it says uh, understand the Word of God, it means understand experientially. And that led us to the fifth birthmark, which was, I gave you the, the text in Luke 18.1, which said that men ought always to what? Pray. And not to faint is the rest of the verse. Then I said, what's the, what's the next mark? And the church said, prayer. Well, if I said the mark of a true believer was prayer, everybody would go, oh, man, whew, I got that one. Whew. Everybody prays, right? I mean, the most godless people in the world pray. Get them in, get them in a war. Get them in, uh, in trouble, amen? That's when people pray. And that's, we talked about that sun, or Sunday evening. And everybody prays. But that's not the mark of a true believer. The mark of a true believer is uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Pray, how? Without ceasing. It's also found in Luke 18.1 that men ought always to pray. The rest of it says, and not to faint. And so real believers are always in an attitude of prayer. Always aware that God is and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. We're aware of His presence. We, he walks with me and talks with me. A long life's narrow way, the songwriter said. And uh, we're ever aware that God is present with us. At least we should be. And if we're saved, we certainly know that that's the case. And so it's prayer and adherence to prayer. God does not even hear the unsaved prayer, the self-centered prayer, the selfish, sinful prayers of those who use him like Santa Claus or call on him when they're in trouble. It says in John 9, 31, actually the Bible says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, him he heareth. Well, the second part of that verse is that one who's born again. That's the one who worships God, does his will, and that's the one God hears. But God doesn't hear lost people. And I'm going to talk more about that tonight in the message, as I give you the message for tonight. And uh, Isaiah 59, 2, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And so that is why the prayers of those who profess salvation but who remain lost are not answered. They don't see answered prayer. And uh, the sixth birthmark then was assurance of salvation. Galatians 4, 6, And because you are sons of God, has sent forth the Spirit, uh, God has sent forth his spirit, uh, the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Because you are sons. God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out a father. That means daddy. And so you have the assurance of salvation if you've been genuinely born again and came to biblical repentance by the grace of God. And then uh, Romans 8, 16 on that subject also, assurance of salvation. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so we have the assurance of salvation and God's spirit bears witness with our spirit. And then lastly, the last mark that I gave you, the seventh mark on Sunday evening, is an overwhelming burden for others that causes us to share Christ. I call it the soul winner's heart or the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, burden for others that causes us to witness for Christ. The Bible says you shall be witnesses uh, after the Spirit of God comes upon you and when the Spirit comes upon us, we indeed desire to be witnesses and tell other people. We're even concerned for our enemies, my worst enemy in the world. When I understand the truth of this book and understand that people die and go to a devil's hell prepared for the devil and his angels, I don't want that for anybody when I really understand the truth of this spiritual, supernatural book 
that tells me of eternal damnation and eternal hell. How could I want that even for my worst enemy? When you know it's really true, your heart goes out. Even if a person treats you wrong, you don't want them to you don't want anybody to die and go there because you know it's real. Is it really real to you? Well, if you've been saved, it is. Now folks, these marks are supernatural. Every one of these marks are supernatural. There's nothing natural about them. And as I shared on Sunday, it's very, very, very frustrating when you get on the other side of salvation, you get really saved, and God opens your eyes supernaturally, and then when you relate uh, experientially in your heart to both frames of mind, in other words, you know what it's like to be not saved, and you know what it's like the difference when you get saved, if you've been saved. And, uh, boy, I remember when that happened to me. I spent all my life having made that profession, and I, I thought, I mean, I was sure I was okay. I would have told you when my picture on my track was taken on that day that I was saved. I'd used the word saved. And I, and I wasn't being facetious. I was being sincere. And I would tell you I did that when I was a kid. I walked the aisle and did what you're supposed to do. I received Jesus as my Savior. And I really, honestly, in an unsaved state of mind, thought that I was saved. When I got saved, I remember I felt like Ebenezer Scrooge. I woke up from the bad dream. The bad dream was over. I didn't have any scripture to relate to. I honestly thought immediately about Ebenezer Scrooge. It was like, whoo, whoo. I was like silly. I mean, this was real. God was real. He changed my heart. He caused me to not want to spend another minute being what I spent my whole life to be. I, I left everything I lived for. It wasn't just a whim, or I didn't just grow up, or, and, uh, you know, some people, a lot of people have interpreted that, but God changed me miraculously. And when he did, man, I saw the difference. And immediately I realized there were other people like I was, who think they're saved, made some intellectual profession, but they don't have what I got. And uh, I used to look at people and hear them give testimonies and say, I believe the same thing. I got the same thing as them. But I didn't have it at all. I didn't have a smidgen of it. And yet I would say I did or I was deluded in my unsafe frame of mind. And so it becomes very frustrating when I preach these things because I'm fully aware that anybody unsaved, even people who've made professions of faith, uh, can be deluded and deceived by the, uh, their heart and the, the devil even. So, only God can bring a human being to the other side, into genuine salvation. I can't do that. All I can do is tell others the difference. The major problem is that when I do that, unsaved people take and interpret what I'm telling them with an unregenerate mind, and they make of it whatever they desire, like I did before I was saved. Two things make it nigh on to impossible to communicate these things to others. Number one, Satan is very real and works in the mind of human beings. Number two, the unregenerate heart is dead, lost, and blind. I mean, this is the craziest thing in the world. What am I doing going to talk to? I say, Lord, i got to talk to dead, lost, blind people? He said, yep. Go in the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what he told me to do. And that's all i got to know about. i got to do what my Heavenly Father told me to do. Amen. But it's very hard because Satan is very real, works in the mind. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 and 4. Satan is very real, works in the mind, and the unregenerate heart is dead, lost, and blind. Here's what the Bible says. But if our gospel or our good news be hid, it is hid, hid to them that are what? Lost. Lost. Okay, so whoever this is talking about is lost. In whom the God of this world, notice the small g of this world, and who is that? I'm, most of you know this, but devil. it's the devil, it's Satan. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them, see he works in the mind, that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And so Satan's very real, works in the mind. God told me that. The unregenerate heart is dead, lost, and blind. Satan is blinding the mind, it says here. The God, it says it's hid to them that are lost. And uh, Ephesians 2, 1, you don't have to turn, you may if you like, says you hath he quickened who were what? Dead, dead in trespasses and sins. 
So in an unsaved state of mind, we're dead spiritually. That's a hard job for Christian people to talk to dead, lost, blind people. And, and we can't do anything. All we can do is obey God and do what he, t do, do what he tells us to do. Unsaved people are going to continue to do what unsaved people do. They're going to interpret what we say in their own frame of mind. And if it's an unregenerate state of mind, I've, heard pe I've had people in the church come and they got all kinds of explanations for why I left my career. Some say, well, you weren't really that, you weren't really that big in show business, were you? If that would have mean anything really or not. I mean, uh, Christian people would come and it's like hope against hope. That's why he left, he, because he really didn't have anything in the world. I mean, anybody that had the same thing happen to them as happened to me, they don't have to, any question as to what happened to me. Amen? They don't have to worry about how big I was. I was about five foot ten and a half. I weighed about 155 pounds back then, much more skinny and emaciated from the things I was doing and the way I was living. But uh, this idea of somebody's big, or they had all kinds of reasons. They said, well, you got old and decrepit and you couldn't make it anymore in show business. Yeah, I was 24 years old. I was ready for the nursing home, amen? I mean, at the height of my career. <laughs> I mean, my career was going pretty good. But you see, Christian people, all over my, all through my life, I've tried to explain. And when they do, I highly doubt that they had the same thing happen to them as happened to me. You didn't have to be a rock and roll guy. You didn't have to come from my past. But if you had what happened to me happen to you, you got no question what happened to me. Or the Apostle Paul, or anybody that got saved, amen? Because the same thing happened to you. And that was called a Damascus Road experience, which I advocate every real Christian has. Every real Christian... You're passed from darkness unto light. You're passed from death unto life. That's a major, major change in your life. And if it's happened to you, you know it's happened. If you're not sure, then maybe you got intellectual knowledge or you never really had a Damascus Road experience and never really got saved. I don't know, but uh, I am told to give you this message. Ephesians 2.5 says... Even when we were dead in sins, hath God quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye what? Saved. saved. Amen. Now notice, by grace are you saved. Colossians 2.13, And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. John 5.24, these are notes that I had that I did not incorporate into the Sunday message, and I think they're very important. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from what? Death unto life. That's a major cataclysmic change. Amen? And Jesus said it. Ephesians 4.18 having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Now again, I'm talking to you about those things I just mentioned earlier. Satan's very real, works in the mind, and the unregenerate heart is dead, lost, and blind. These scriptures bear that out, and that's plenty enough to make you realize that what I just said is scriptural. Now, you need to listen carefully to these biblical marks, and be honest with yourself as to whether you really possess them or you don't. And I gave them on Sunday. I just gave them back to you again. And people need to have these things shown to them that are professing salvation because 2 Peter 1.10 says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. I gave you this verse on Sunday. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. So we're exhorted to make our calling and election sure. We need to be checking ourselves as individuals. Don't worry about the guy next to you. You've got to ask, do I have these marks? Don't worry about other people. Unregenerate people. The devil will get people looking at somebody else saying, well, uh, you know, look how he lives. You live better than he lives. And unsaved people do that. And they'll look at people. Calling, how do you know the guy that's calling himself Christian is really a Christian? Don't worry about him. Make sure you are. Make sure when you die, you go to heaven. Amen? You don't know who you're looking at, stumbling and falling. Maybe it's a believer stumbling and falling. Maybe it's not a believer. But the devil's deluding you and fooling you. You need to look at you because it says in the Word of God, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, look at that one. I look at it again. I gave it to you Sunday, but this is very important. And <clears throat> you need to share this with others also. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, the first two words, what do they say, folks? Say it out loud, gang. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Let me hear you say the first two words. Examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. Now, is that what I'm telling you to do? That's biblical, amen? 
Whether you be in the faith, prove, that means test, try, discern your own selves. Know ye not your own self, uh, know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Now reprobate is unapproved, rejected. By implication, worthless, literally, literally or morally, a castaway. Now, if you, by the grace of God, realize that you don't have these marks, what you need to do, anybody needs to do that realizes this, is cast yourself at the mercy of God, get on your face before the true and living God, and pour your heart out to Him. Stay right there, don't move until He works that marvelous work of salvation in you. I think of John Bunyan's testimony. I can't tell you the whole thing, but Bunyan had a terrible, long turmoil. Uh, he, he wrote a book called something about uh, Bad Man, and uh, I can't remember the title of the book, but he gives a whole uh, volume on his testimony and his struggle about salvation. And he made professions of faith, and then he saw people that had something he knew he didn't have, and he wrestled with this thing, but he kept on wrestling. And so you just cast yourself at the mercy of the true and living God and hang on to him like John Bunyan did. That's quite a story to read that. A uh, guy that wrote Pilgrim's Progress and many other wonderful works, John Bunyan. But to read his actual conversion story is quite a, quite a thing to read. Now when the Spirit of God brings you to genuine repentance, the first birthmark, you see, when, when God really does that, He crushes you. He utterly humbles you. He stops you in your track. Read the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road. Paul was a proud, cocky Jew who was pretty smart in the Scriptures. Amen? And when he got saved, man, that all went away. Amen? Amen. And God has a way to do that. Because when you come in contact with the true and living God, you realize who He is, and immediately you realize, if you come in real contact with Him, you realize who you are. So it's like Isaiah. When Isaiah got a glimpse of the glory of God in Isaiah chapter 6, what did, what did he say? It said, uh, look at Isaiah chapter 6. <laughs> if you forgot, this is, this is quite a passage. I, Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah got a little glimpse of God's glory, Isaiah 6, 1, Isaiah, and it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I, that's Isaiah, saw also the next word. What does it say? The Lord. Uh, that's two words. You're just going to sleep on me, Ken. Okay. <laughs> Only looking for one. See that little, that little definite article there? That's just so little, you just want to pass right by it and get to that big word. I know how it is. Brother Ken just blurted it out. But in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the next word. Lord. The. The. Not the Lord. The. The next word. The. I want to point out, it's a definite article. There's only one. Amen? There's only one of whatever's coming next. The. Now the next word. What is it? Lord. Lord. Okay, Isaiah gets a glimpse of this Lord. Sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. That's angelic beings. Each one had six what? Wings. Six what? You, you know what, folks? I believe that angels... You, you know what seraphims are? Seraphims are what? Angels. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. So it says, stood the seraph Each one had six what? I believe that angels have wings. And I don't believe it because you sent me a Christmas card with some little dude with a little ring around his head and he got flappers on the side. Angels have wings. Amen? I believe it because God said so right here in the book. Angels have wings. And in this case, they have how many? Six, Six wings. With twain, that means two. With two wings, this angel in the presence of Almighty God did what? Covered his face. He couldn't even look at the outward effulgence or bright shining of the glory of this majestic one, this almighty God. The angels in his presence, with two wings they cover their face. With twain or two he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, I'm a pretty good guy, Lord, and I'm going to be used to you, and I'll be a preacher for you, and you'll really use me. And is that, you're going to sleep on me. Is that what it says? Nope. No. What, was what does it say? What was what was then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's what happens when you come into the presence of the true and living God. You see... He notices 
that there are people around him that un got unclean lips too, but he sees he's in the same stew. So he's not looking down his nose at those others who got unclean lips because he got unclean lips. He's not seeing himself as better because all his pride is gone. Amen. Amen. Pride goes away in the presence of God. When you really meet God, friends, <coughs> he humbles you. When the Spirit of God brings you to genuine repentance, the first birthmark, he crushes you, utterly humbles you by showing who he really is and how wretched you and I are in his sight. And you come aware of that. <clears throat> when you realize that you're utterly worthless, in other words, zero, you can't look at other people and feel superior or raise yourself up above them. You can no longer look down on others, cast blame, try to point out the fault of other people. That's an unsaved attitude, an unsaved frame of mind, and we all have done it. When you get saved, you realize how unworthy and wretched you are. I did. And God puts you in your place. You see, you die to all of the other nonsense. Mark 8, 35. For whosoever will save his life shall what? Lose it. Lose it. That's that little two words there got to be looked at real careful. <laughs> whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall, what? Lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall what? You see, lose his life. That's giving up, folks. That's coming to the end of self, sin, pride, wickedness, and trusting him. I'll quote it again, Galatians 2.20, For I am crucified, Paul said, with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now after the Apostle Paul, uh, excuse me, uh, the Apostle Paul is an illustration here of this. I gave you some things about him in Sunday school last Sunday. The Apostle Paul killed Christians. He spoke against them. He criticized them. Yet he knew the scriptures better than most people do. But he criticized them. He spoke against them. He cussed them, and he killed them. Look at Acts chapter 9 and verse 10 through 31. Acts chapter 9. I want to point out in Acts chapter 9, uh, Acts chapter 9, and this is the Damascus Road story that I gave you in Sunday school last Sunday. <coughs> but uh, see, uh, look at Acts chapter 9 verse 1. Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter, how? Next word. Against. against the disciples of the Lord. When unto thy priest desired letters to the master of synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether men, women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And so Paul hated Christians. He talked against them. He criticized them. He looked down his snout at them, his pharisaical snout. He killed them. And he says that we looked at other passages. We don't have time tonight. But you can look at Acts uh, 22 and Acts 26 at another time and read what he says he did to believers. He criticized them. He spoke against them. He hated them. He killed them. But anyway, in uh, verse 10, he gets saved there. And in, in verse 10, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Rise, go to the street which is called Straight, inquire the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he does what? Pray. Pray. Paul just wasn't praying using God like Santa Claus. He got connected because he got saved in this passage. And that's one of the marks he got saved. He began to pray. There are other marks here too. But it says, He's seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming and putting his hand on him. He might receive his sight. Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to the saints of Jerusalem. That's my point. He hated Christians. Hated God's people. He did evil to the saints at Jerusalem. And uh, he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, he's a chosen vessel unto me. God singled him out, see? To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I'll show him how many great things he must what? Suffer. I told you. When God saves you, he brings you to humility. So much so, it doesn't matter what you suffer for him. You're, you're humble. You have no pride to say, Well, I deserve something better. God's going to show old Paul how many things he got to suffer for him, and Paul's going to be A-OK -okay with that because Paul got saved. Amen? Amen? 
It doesn't matter what God takes you through when you get saved because you know God. But I, I see people make professions of faith and go through a little bit of trouble, a little bit of suffering, and they quit on God. Now, they could have never got saved. God didn't change their heart like he did Paul's. I'm getting to another point. I want to get it to it. It says here, Ananias went his way, entered into the house, putting his hands on him. Now, notice, now here's this Christian that Paul hated, putting his hands on Paul. God's directing that. I mean, Paul could have said, oh, don't touch me. You got cooties before. I mean, I mean, who's this guy touching me? See, but Ananias, this Christian guy, puts his hand, and God directed it, puts his hands on Paul and says, what's he say? Look at the words. And he said, Brother Saul. Brother Saul. Amen. Praise the Lord. And the Lord, even Jesus that appeared, uh, uh, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way uh, as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with with the Holy Ghost. And God brought that through this Christian man by His grace. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. Now that could be, uh, that's actual physical scales, but it's also scales of blindness in the spirit, spiritually, as Paul was blind spiritually. <coughs> he was physically blinded here, but uh, both are represented. Paul's now having his eyes open to the truth. And he received sight, both physical and spiritual. Forthwith, and he arose, and first thing he did was what? He got baptized to show that he was dying to himself. Whosoever tries to save his life shall lose it. Whosoever loses his life, when you get saved, baptism is a testimony that you have died to yourself. Have you come to that point? When you got baptized, is that what it meant to you? That you were buried, identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and risen again to walk in new life, new life in Christ by God's grace. When he received me, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with who? Disciples. Look at the text. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples. Wait a minute now. He hated them people. <clears throat> and he was now many days with the disciples that read the message. Things changed, amen? Amen. Amen. And straightway he did what? Preached. He preached Christ in the synagogues that he's the Son of God. But all that heard him were, what? Amazed. Amazed. And said, is not this he that destroyed them which called on the name of Jerusalem? Because he wanted to destroy them. He cussed them out. He criticized them. He put them down. That's what unsaved people do. But now he's walking with the disciples. Some of the disciples are leery of him. He did it so. That's how violent and vicious he was against Christians. Some of these people still not sure. <clears throat> can you blame them? And came, came hither for the intent that he might... Bring them bound unto the chief priests. But Saul increased more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt in Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Amen. And that many days were and, and after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to do what? <clears throat> kill him. To kill him, okay. So now the world, the Jews, who he was a Pharisee with, and was one of his uh, I mean, they were they, they liked Paul. He was one of, their, one of their pretty boys. I mean, he was a Pharisee, a Pharisee. He knew that now the Jews seek to kill him. That's how it changes, see. But their laying away <clears throat> was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then who? Ah, the disciples, his brothers, his new family. See, now he's hanging out with the disciples. He ain't criticizing them anymore, amen. <laughs> I mean, these guys are going to risk their lives. They took him by night and let him down the wall in a basket. Because that's what brothers will do. They'll even risk their own life. The Bible says that we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And that's what we're seeing, live and in color here. When Saul was come to Jerusalem, he uh, essayed to join himself with who? The disciples. disciples. That's what he wanted to do. But they were, they were all afraid of him. So many people are human beings too. It's a, see, they were scared of him. And believe not that he was a disciple. They didn't believe him. They thought he was phony. That's, that's how bad this dude was. I mean, he had to be real bad for these people not to, to, to do this. And uh, I can't make a, a big enough uh, thing about it here. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoke to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them <coughs> coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And, uh, uh, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what happens when you get saved. See, I talked about witnessing, and, and that's one of the marks, and that's what he's doing. And, the, 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 and disputed against the Grecians. 
But they went about to slay him. They tried to kill him. Which when the brethren, when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost and were multiplied. Amen. And so Paul has a new relationship to God's people, the disciples. He doesn't criticize. He doesn't speak against. He doesn't kill them anymore. He loves them. And that's what happens when you get saved. Now, I want to give you the signs of counterfeit conversion. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing, and that was my extra notes. Turn and read 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. 2 Timothy 3, 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient parents, unthankful, unholy, Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And that list of things I just read, these dudes have a form of what? Godliness. They have a form of godliness. Now, you might have read this a million times, but this is religious. These are people maybe claiming even to be Christians. They have a form of godliness, but denying what? the power thereof, and it says, from such, turn away. Now, verse 7 of that text, these people are ever what? Learning. Learning and what? Never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Folks, you can learn, you can have knowledge, you can be ever learning, and possibly never come to the knowledge of the truth. I mean... I would have listened to stories about Jesus when I was not saved. And there are many people who learn things. They learn facts. They study the Bible like Paul did. He knew the scriptures better then than most anybody knows uh, the Bible today. And yet he was lost as a goose. Um, let's look at, uh, look, look at Romans 2, 5 through 29. That's a long passage, but <coughs> look at it quickly with me. Romans 2. <clears throat> Romans chapter 2. I got to go quick. And uh, verse uh, 5. Romans 2 5. But after thy hardness and impotent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. <clears throat> He's talking. <clears throat> Uh, about uh, before you, after, after the hardness and impotent heart, uh, uh, who, verse 6, let's keep reading, you'll get it. Who will render to every man according to what? His deeds. His deeds. To them who, by patient continuance in well doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. But unto them are, uh, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. <clears throat> For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the what? Doers. Doers of the law shall be justified. Okay, so you can hear a lot of scripture, you can spend a lot of time in church, but still not have the marks. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. I'm talking about their conscience, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Here it is. There, I just said it. They're what? They're conscious, also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the mean, while accusing or else excusing one another. Okay, you see, some unsaved people having these kind of principles or conscience, they actually, when I preach on repentance, an unsaved man could take and say, well, I got 
I, I, it got a conscience. So they relate it to conscious things. Like they got a conscience about good and bad. And that's possible. That doesn't mean you came to biblical repentance. That don't mean, mean God humbled you and took that uh, st uh, stony heart out of your flesh and gave you a, a sensitive heart of flesh as he says he will to those who really come to him. But it says in verse 16, In the day when God shall judge the what? Secrets. Secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. I could preach a message just on that text. <laughs> <laughs> the secrets of men. Man, uh, mercy, folks. You know, we got secrets. Uh, there's things in your heart that your wife doesn't know, your husband doesn't know, your, nobody knows, but they, God knows. Amen? Amen? And we all got them. We got closets that get dirty. We got to clean them up. But the secrets of men by Jesus Christ are going to be judged by God. That scares the fire out of me. I mean, whew, Lord, help me. I just want to fall down and weep because I want it cleaned out before I get there. Amen? Lord, I don't. I mean, he he knows, <laughs> he knows. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and re and uh, re, and rest this rest as you rest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. Okay, I'm talking about these are Jews. But I'm talking to people who make their boast that they got the mark. They're saved, and knoweth His will, and approveth the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. And are confident that thou thyself are a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. See, these people pride themselves that they are they're godly people and they can guide other people and, and uh, they can help people that are in darkness see. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another... Teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? See, talking about phony profession, see? That's what it is. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, uh, through breaking of the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. For circumcision, for circumcision verily, or truly, or surely, profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, excuse me, verse 26, therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not the uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not the uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision doth, uh, doth transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one where? Inward. Inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, the heart, remember, new heart, in the what? Spirit. Spirit, and not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. You see, um, counterfeit conversion has knowledge of what the Scripture says, but no real spiritual truth at all, obviously. Secondly, i got to go on. Counterfeit conversion has conscience, I covered this, but no real Holy Spirit conviction on the genuine conversion or false repentance. I think that's been seen there. But let's look at James chapter 1 and verse 23 through 24 along the same lines. It's complementary to what I just gave you. James 1, 23 and 24. Everybody look at these texts. They're very important. Counterfeit conversions have conscience. They can have, they can have conscience, but no real Holy Spirit conviction. And, and they will relate to somebody who's claiming repentance what they're to say, well, I got a, I got a sensitivity toward right and wrong, or th th that's how they interpret this. I, I see it happen all the time. James 1, 23 through 24. For if any be a, what? Hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, means a mirror. You look in the mirror, for he beholdeth himself, and he goes his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. You see? But whosoever look into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, and, and do what? Whosoever look into the perfect law of liberty and what? Continue. Continueth therein. That's an important word. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. 
If any man among you seem to be religious, now he's talking about among the church, you know, people that are coming around James, and bridleth not his what? Tongue. Tongue. Okay, that's talking about criticism. That's talking about negative speaking. That's talking about bad attitude. If any man, any man among you seem to be religious, claims to be a Christian, claims that, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man, religion is what? Empty, in vain, waste. James 1.27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. That takes humility to do that, and that's what we're talking about when God humbles you and brings you to the end of yourself. And to keep himself what? Unspotted, Unspotted from the world. That's what a Christian's goal is. Counterfeit has a conscience, but no, really whole, no real Holy Spirit conviction on the genuine conversion. He has false repentance. False repentance. Three, counterfeit conversion has a very defensive spirit. Those with counterfeit conversion, they have very defensive spirit. And it will manifest that spirit to justify themselves in whatever they want to do. You see, I announced on Sunday morning that I was going to mark everybody in the church auditorium. Because Paul said, mark them who walk so as you have us as an example. So I'm commanded to do that. That's a command. That's a biblical command. The Bible also says in Romans 16 that we're to mark those who cause divisions. And that those that are in error, we're to mark them. And that's biblical to do. It's not judgmental. It's what we're supposed to do. Now, a counterfeiter has a very defensive spirit. When he's marked, he'll a, a counterfeit conversion in a meeting like this even would say, uh, uh, who's he to judge me? Who's that preacher to judge me? Or who are you to judge me? So you see, the, the attitude represented there is like a defensive spirit. And... Uh, they try to justify themselves. You know, I'm just as good as, or even better, than the people that profess to be Christians in that church. You ever heard that? I have. I heard that from people who claim to be Christians. They're looking at other people who claim to be Christians, and they're, that's what they're doing with their Christianity. They're sorting it out that way. That's a definite sign of a counterfeit conversion. I don't care what you're doing. i got to worry about number one over here. Amen? I don't mean that wrong. I love you. I'm concerned. And I want to help you if I can. But I'm not going to look at you and criticize you. I'm worse than you. Amen. I have need. Amen. And uh, a person that knows that they're uh, a sinner and knows what God showed them, he ain't looking down his nose at other people. And God knows that's not what I'm doing and giving you this message. I'm sharing with you God's principles and God's truth. And my heart goes out to you if you don't have these things. but uh, Or whoever doesn't. But so many do this. <coughs> you know, uh, these people claim to be Christians, and they got all the answers. They know all about the Bible and Christianity, so they tell us. Say, true Christians don't get ruffled at all if one challenges their conversion or their salvation. If you really have it, nothing is going to move you or bother you. Amen? It will not bother you if somebody questions you or challenges you along these lines or exhorts you to make your calling election sure and to examine yourself. If you're getting ruffled by that, you better examine yourself. You're probably lost. I've had people come up to me and say, uh, and, and say are you saved? I've had people hand me tracks. I don't get ruffled. I don't get proud and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know. But, no, I'm, I'm a preacher. No, no. I, I appreciate that. Amen? They're concerned for my soul. Amen? Amen? And that's what we ought to be. True Christians are not threatened by somebody preaching a message like this. But unsaved people are. You see... Counterfeit conversions react when they hear these kind of things, and that would be a proof positive that you need desperately to come to genuine biblical repentance before a holy and living God. Now, a counterfeit conversion can have fellowship, fellowship being an association or joint interest or feeling. They can come to a church and hang out and find some means whereby they can talk to people and relate and have a, you know, a... Uh, you know, we talked about clubhouses in the summertime here. That's what it is to them. It's like a little clubhouse. But you see, they don't have Holy Spirit koinonia. The word for fellowship in the Bible is koinonia. It means communion. It means common possession of the Spirit of God, which draws individuals together intimately in Christ. 
Our fe- we, you know, some of us like to hunt. We have that. We, we have uh, fellowship and talk about hunting. Blah 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 blah. But that's not what really brings us together here. I've said it so many times. As you got other common bonds. Some of you got sports or whatever you got. But that's not your common. That's not your koinonia here. Our fellowship is in Christ Jesus. Amen. And those who are saved enjoy that fellowship the most. That means the most to them. The fellowship that they have with real believers in Christ Jesus. Now. <coughs> You know, so many people have absolutely no desire to be in church. They skip most of the church services, and uh, they have no genuine love for the brethren. Uh, they know so much about the Bible, they can see Ura and all the other Christians around them and tell you all about it. And they'll actually even brag about their ability to do that and feel themselves superior having that ability to see all the faults of all the other people. I've, I've seen it, folks. I've seen it. They lack the humility that only the Holy Spirit can give when the heart is supernaturally transformed and changed. When we are made to realize of our own wickedness and really experience the grace and forgiveness of Almighty God. The counterfeit conversion will hold grudges, criticize believers. They'll criticize preachers. They manifest a very negative spirit. They will oppress. They'll harp, harp, harp. They'll justify and defend their own wrong attitude by condemning others and trying to build themselves up in their condemnation. The counterfeit will shy away from too much fellowship with the saints. They'll definitely shy away from true koinonia. They don't like it. They don't enjoy that kind of fellowship. They will not attend church meetings, programs, banquets, get-togethers faithfully as genuine believers do around their fellowship in Christ Jesus simply because they'd ra- really rather not be there. Uh, they have no real desire to be with God's people, studying God's word, or communing with the saints in spiritual fellowship. See, when you do, when a human being does or learns something, like Pavlov's theory, the, the, uh, the old uh, dog with the ring and the bell, you know, when you do something or learn something out of rote catechism, it is usually a burdensome task, the thing that you learn. And if the opportunity comes for you to disregard that task, you will. No one can place in you a desire and a true love to do the will of God but God himself. Nobody can do that. I can't do that. I learned that a long time ago. I have to tell you what God says, but I can't place this in you. Those who God works in to will and to do of his good pleasure, they want to be in the word of God. Amen? They want to be in fellowship, koinonia. They want to be in church whenever there is church. They want to be there. Now, many lost people attend church out of duty and usually based on their own comfort and schedule. They put some time in and they feel like they fulfilled their quote-unquote duty to God and now God will be pleased with their efforts. And uh, many others attend church because of peer pressure or simply to have they have a great concern about what people think of them. And uh, they don't, so they, so they, they at least put some time in because they're worried about what others think of them. So they tip God with spare time and pocket change and feel like they've done their duty, showed face, and God's now somehow accepting of their efforts. We have people in our Baptist churches like that. A soul that God has genuinely converted, transformed, saved, regenerated, loves to do the will of God, be in God's word in order to learn more of the will of God to be with God's people as often as they can be. They would even feel deprived to miss a service or a study in the Word of God, a session with the saints. That's my sentiments. If I had to miss, I'd feel deprived. I feel like I should have been there. Not because I'm worried about somebody thinking about me. Amen? Amen? We love to be with the saints. Now, I'm not trying to coerce anybody to be more faithful out of duty. However, if you find yourself in the category as I'm describing it above, my concern would be the reality and genuineness of your profession of faith. You see, the counterfeit conversion acts in a totally different way than a genuine conversion. Now, we get to the matter of prayer. Again, counterfeit conver- uh, conversions will pray when they're in enough trouble. We already talked about that pretty much. You know, you get a loved one, your husband, your wife, your child, or a close family met- member gets very sick, Nigh on to that, man, you're going to be on your knees praying. You're going to be crying. 
an accident happens, uh, you're laying there, blood's coming out your ear and your eye and your nose, man, you're going to be a prey in some drastic situation. Weather gets very bad, some storm, some tsunami, some desperate situation, man, these counterfeit conversions will, will, will pray. But then they complain and they're very dissatisfied, even accusing God when they believe that their prayers are not answered. When something goes the other way of how they were praying, or at least answered in accordance with their own selfish desire and their own selfish will. Counterfeit conversions will react that way even to God. They'll even have a, 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 an attitude against God. They use God like Santa Claus, call on him rarely, have no fellowship with him or his people. Then they get mad at God when they feel like he did not do what they directed him to do. Well, folks, <laughs> that's not a genuine believer. A genuine believer knows that God answers his prayers. He has prayers answered. He knows God's for real. And he's willing, if, if, he asks God, if a believer asks God to do something, he comes humbly to God. And, and God does not do it. God says no. The true believer is accepting of that and never, ever gets an attitude toward God. Amen? Amen. My soul in the morning, folks. I know some genuine believers who been through it more so than me and I just believe that he'll never leave us nor forsake us I've seen it happen I mean it ain't I ain't been tried and proven all the way there's there, there, you know I can think of some pretty hairy times in my life where I was clinging to God and praying and, and uh, worried about things but uh, God's been good over the years and I've seen uh, some believers uh, I got to give them a lot more credit than me they going through things that I don't know if I can make it through but anyway, some desperate situation comes, we call on God, and if God doesn't do it the way we want Him to, true believers acquiesce, they submit. They say, yes, Lord, you know what's best. They don't have an attitude, amen? Now, the counterfeit conversion will really lack the assurance of salvation if they were honest. You see, the Bible says the Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If, uh, if there's a false professor... Uh, in the midst of the church, the, the spirit itself does not bear witness with their spirit. They are the children of God. So there's no real assurance in their heart. They may lie and tell you there is, but they really don't have that assurance. They're not really sure. And that would be, if, if you have that situation, you need to take hold of the Lord and uh, talk to Him and wrestle with Him. And then the last birthmark we talked about was having a burden for others. The counterfeit conversion has really not ever clearly shared the gospel with anyone. They've heard about winning souls. They've heard about witnessing. They hear it. They might have tried to say a few religious words to somebody. But the counterfeit conversion really has never clearly shared the gospel with anyone. And most have never led anyone to Christ. Never. They'll make all kinds of excuses as to why this is true. And they'll justify this lack, you know, million and one excuses you can make. But uh, I don't have the gift of gab. My personality is not like yours, blah, 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 blah. If the Spirit of God is convicting you and convincing you that you don't have these marks tonight, half of the battle is over in your life. I would exhort you to quit making excuses like that. Stop depending on and leaning on your own sinful defenses. Cast yourself at the mercy of Almighty God. Yield to Him. Come to Him. And He'll not cast you out. He'll do the work in you. Amen. Look at John chapter 6, 37. I'm going to look at a few texts and we'll close. John 6, 37. <clears throat> John 6, 37. Jesus speaking, All that the Father giveth me shall what? Come, Come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise, that means no way, no way, that's what the word means, it's an old English word, means no way cast out. It's a very emphatic word. <clears throat> so I, again, exhort you to cast yourself at the mercy of Almighty God. Yield to him. Come to him. Stay right with him until he gives you that assurance. Tell him that you're a phony, like I did about 40, how many, 40 years ago, 40 some years ago. 1973. How many years ago is that? 42. 42 years ago. 
I said, Lord, I'm phony as a $3 bill. I don't know you. And I received Christ as my Savior, genuinely, sincerely, by the grace of God. But uh, him that cometh to me, a very familiar verse, I'll in no wise cast down. Now, John 6, 66, from that time, it says, many of his disciples went what? John 6, 66, you there? Went back. Many of his disciples went back. Now, these are, these are counterfeit conversions. <laughs> they went back, and they did what? They walked no more with him. Phony is a $3 bill. That was me many years ago. John 6, 67, then Jesus said unto the twelve, the ones he called out individually, Will you go away also? And that's what I want to say to you tonight. Will you go away also? And I'll say to you after saying that, no genuine believer would ever turn away. They say what Peter said in John 6, 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. I'll never forget. I'll never forget when Brother Bissell first got saved. He tells the story. I tell the story. But it was, it was something that I really, I really had an emotional breakdown on. Brother Bissell was just saved, not saved very long at all. Moved up here, living in a little mobile home, like the one that used to be over here that Mary Warner lived in. A little two-by-squirt place, but it looked like stuff was going to cave in on you in there. He talks about it once in a while. You've heard him. <clears throat> Only saved a few months, gave up his career, show business, blah, 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 blah. And, and uh, his father, who we witnessed to, we witnessed to Joe Bissell in the, in the nightclub there that he owned. One Sunday we went there, Bissell and I, and I poured my heart out to him. I didn't know a whole lot, but as I poured my heart out to him, Bissell, his, Bissell's dad was a rough guy, but he, he liked me. I don't know why. He liked me in the old, he liked me on the other side of the fence. And I don't know why he did, but it was the grace of God. Something to do with the Lord, I imagine. But I, I told him what happened to me. And Frank was just saying that he was just backing me up and telling his dad the same thing happened to him. And his father sat there, I'll never forget, we sat around a checkered, red and white checkered tablecloth around one of them little bar tables. The bar was closed that day. Tears ran down that guy's cheeks. He's weeping. Now, that's a tough guy. He don't cry easy. He's weeping. And uh, I pleaded with him to receive Christ as Savior. He said to me, Peter, what would I do with all this? He's pointing at his nightclub. I said, Mr. Bissell, it don't matter. I said, you die. This is staying here. Amen. I said, I, of course, I, let, I walked away from everything. God, by his grace, showed me that what shall a proud man again in the whole world lose his own soul. Amen. Amen. I might have quoted, I don't know if I even knew that verse. I wasn't saved that long myself. But I poured my heart out, begged with him, pleaded with him. Then I asked him to, I was, I was going to give a testimony in my church that night, I think. And I asked him to come, and he said, nah, he said, roof would cave in. I said, well, we got people to fix it. We got carpenters that they'll patch it up. <laughs> And he never did come. It was only about, I'm going to say it was three weeks to a month after that meeting that me and Frank Bissell and his dad had, that his father was shaving in the bathroom one morning, 49 years old. And he fell down the bathroom. His, uh, Mr. Bissell heard him fall, and she couldn't get the door open. The door was jammed. He was jamming the door, laying there on the floor. He had a stroke or something and went into a coma. He got into the bathroom. They got him out. I got the phone call from Brother Bissell. That his dad had a stroke, and he was so happy. He said he was happy? Yeah. He was thrilled. He said, Peter, this is it. He's going to get saved. God's going to save him. Hey, he's going to bring him out of this, and God's going to save him. That's what he's saying. And I'm, I, when I left him, I, I was like, but what if God don't? And I'm pleading with God. Please, God. I'm only a young Christian. Don't let Mr. Bissell die. He went in the hospital. He's in a coma. Days go by, one after the other. Brother Bissell's all, you know, he's going to come out. He's going to come out. He's going to be all right. He's like all positive. And I'm, I'm worried as a young Christian. And I worry anyway. So I guess it was about two weeks go by. And uh, the pastor of our church in Langhorn at that time encouraged uh, Brother Bissell to go to the hospital with him. He said sometimes people in a coma can hear and they, they can they can respond. They can't. You, they don't look like they can, but they can. Let's go see him and talk to him. So the pastor of our church went, held his hand, 
talk to him earnestly and sincerely. And uh, I don't know what came of that. They didn't really, he was in a coma. He didn't get any response. I don't know, it was about two weeks, and I remember my phone rang. And Brother Frank Bissell called me on the phone, and he's weeping. His father had went out into eternity, never came out of the coma. I hung up the phone, and I said, Lord, please, Lord, I don't know. He's going to go back and rock and roll. He's going to quit on you, Lord. He's going to get discouraged now. I'm telling the Lord, see. And I'm weeping. I'm saying, what? I didn't know, even know what to say to the guy. I'm only saved a year and a half myself. I run over there, and I knock on his door, and I'm all upset and emotional. And uh, he answers the door, and he's weeping. He's only saved a few months. Put his arm around me. He said, it's okay, Peter. God knows what he's doing. Amen. He got saved, see? And I've observed that in his life all these years. That's what a Christian does. The counterfeit conversion would have got bitter at God. Like I thought Brother Bissell would. But he really had the Spirit of God. And if you have the Spirit of God, God gives you that supernatural comfort that He gave Pastor Frank Bissell. And He kept them keeping on. And He kept keeping on. And He's been here a whole lot of years, praise God. Amen. But He could have been done right there if He was a counterfeit. Now, He's for real. He got it. And that's been proven many, many times to me. And so you see, folks, it says... <coughs> Peter answered him, to whom shall we go? And Brother Bissell wrote the song that you've sung here many times. I think he's told you that, but he wrote that right at that time in his life. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? That's what God took him to as a young Christian when he went to the Scripture for comfort after his father passed away. The Lord gave him that verse. What? You call that a coincidence, amen? Simon Peter answered him, To whom shall we go? He said, Will you go away also? And Brother Bissell didn't, thank God. Praise the Lord. Man, I was thrilled. It says in verse 69, And we do what? We, what? Say it. Believe, and I hope you do. And are what? Sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Are you? I hope you are tonight. I hope you have genuinely the birthmarks of a true believer. But I've given you tonight the signs of counterfeit conversion. I hope that nobody in this room is in that stew. I hope that we who are saved can take and learn something from these things that will help us and uh, help others as we share with others and teach them the Word of God as God teaches us. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for each and every individual that you brought to this place tonight. This is no mistake that we're here together in this uh, basement tonight. It's not a <coughs> quinky dink or an accident or just because Brother Bissell's got a rehearsal. It's a divine appointment that we meet and do these things tonight and I pray we'd realize that and I pray that the things I've shared <coughs> have been a blessing and encouragement to those who are here. I pray that we've learned something together that will help us to better glorify you and do your will. Father, I pray sincerely if there be anybody in our midst that does not have the birthmarks of a genuine believer but is phony or made a false profession that you would uh, deal with that heart, break them, mold them, make them, and uh, give them uh, joy in their heart and the realization that uh, they are indeed saved and their sins forgiven. They're on the way to heaven. I ask that you'd meet with us now as we close in a special way. In Jesus' name I pray. Heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. And I would assume most of you here tonight are believers in a Sunday evening service like this, but I don't want to preach like that and not give an opportunity. If there's anybody here that does not have the birthmarks, that may be realizing by the grace of God your phony is a $3 bill, and uh, God's convicting you and you're troubled from within, then bow your head, close your eyes, and get a hold of the Lord. I'm just going to encourage you to do that. It's not between you and me, it's between you and the Lord. And he is. He's real. He's definitely here. Definitely will save you if you'll cast yourself at his mercy. 
It says, All that the Father give to me shall come to me, and him that cometh on no wise cast out. So I'm asking you to genuinely come tonight. Wave the white flag. Get rid of all pride. Get rid of all nonsense. Get rid of all sin. And lay it at the cross. Say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ who said yes to the cross for your sin. Maybe some of you are saved. You have the marks and you've gotten off the beaten course. The devil's good at that. He got you all tangled up, mixed up. Maybe you've been out of the will of God. You've gotten backslidden in sin. Maybe you've been uh, critical of uh, other brothers and sisters or preach. You, it can happen to a real believer. <clears throat> I mean, Jesus said to Peter one time, get thee behind me, Satan. We can get in pretty bad straits, can't we? <laughs> so, if you're a Christian and God's burdening you with some matter in your life where you've gotten off course, I don't know what it is. It's not my business. But I'd love to see you get it squared away because you'll be blessed and God will use you better if you confess your sin. <laughs> So I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you. I'm not going to ask you to come forward raise your hand. You've got to raise your heart before God. But I am asking you, if you're not sure you're saved, to get sure. You take a hold of God and pray and ask the Lord to give you that uh, genuine repentance and new heart, love for the brethren, understanding, insatiable desire for the Word of God, prayer and adherence to prayer, assurance of your salvation, and... Uh, genuine concern for others, even your worst enemy. Uh, when I got said one time, I, I, I wouldn't want my enemy to get saved because I really didn't understand what that means. I didn't understand what it means for a guy to die and go to hell. Now I do. And so people can get pretty ornery and get pretty nasty and get pretty rough, but they don't know what's coming. They really don't. When our hearts got to go out to them, folks, if we believe this stuff, we got to keep telling them because it's real. In the morning, we're going to be there. So I'm asking you to take a hold of the Lord, deal with whatever your individual need is. Father, please, Lord, help us to make decisions tonight that will change our lives and help us to be better used to you. I ask that you bless these, my brothers and sisters, to go to different ways and, and uh, draw us near unto yourself. We certainly pray, Lord, for the upcoming presentation, what Brother Bissell's getting ready for upstairs. Thank you for him. And we pray for his physical um, problems that he's having, that you help him, and uh, all the work that he's doing, Lord. I pray you'd uphold him and be your will. The Lord, that your will would be done in all things, that you might uh, save some by your grace, add them to your church in accordance with your will uh, through these things that we're uh, going to do upcoming. I pray that we'll honor and glorify you, Lord, to direct us, and hedge us about, and help us to stay in your will, and, and Lord, uh, I pray that you just, uh, again, work in us to will and do of your good pleasure, we ask in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.